contacted the husband wife team of Manthorne and I guess McElhenney, I didn't say it right, McElhenney, excuse me, James, about speaking to us about some aspect of art and entanglement. They came back to us with a proposal for disentanglement. Perfect, we said, bring it on. Catherine is a specialist in modern art of the Americas, earned her PhD from Columbia University prior to joining the faculty at the Graduate Center of City University of New York. She was director of the research center at the Smithsonian's American Art Museum. The author of many books, her scholarship has long focused on landscape and hemispheric dimensions of American art and more recently on highlighting the role of women within the visual culture of the Americas. James is an author, also publisher, visual artist and blogger, trained at the Tyler School of Art, the Skohegan School of Painting and Sculpture and Yale University. Identifying with historic expeditionary artists, James regards his works as mindful encounters with nature, history, and science, pursuing knowledge and ideas in ways that leave no trace. His works are to be found in the collection of the Hudson River Museum, West Point Museum, Albany Institute of History and Art. James and Catherine live close by to Waylandsburg in Essex. Thank you. Um, just a quick reminder to the audience, if you would like to make sure that your screen is in speaker view, um, I think it will help you appreciate the presentation. And with that, we'll turn it right over to you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm going to just share screen here and we can begin the presentation shortly. Shall you move over? Yeah. Here, let's switch. Good evening and thank you for joining us. As Catherine mentioned, James and I recently relocated to the Champaign, Champlain Valley and is our, as is our habit, we began to seek out artworks painted here and scouted out the sites where they were painted. So this lecture tonight is in a way a result of that getting acquainted exercise. So I'll begin, I will begin and speak for about 15 minutes and then James will follow. So let's start by asking, why do landscape painters head to a particular area? What are they seeking? This pair of pictures provides one suggestion. At the left, Homer, Winslow Homer, uh, shows the White Mountains of New Hampshire, where artists are crowded on the mountain side by side, each painting a nearly identical view. The White Mountains were a popular tourist and artist attraction and became so crowded that it is no longer a wilderness experience at all. On the other side at the right is William Tyler shows himself in the Adirondacks and you, as you can see, alone communing with a wilder nature. So all these artists will take the oil sketches that you can see on their easels and bring them back to the studios where they will serve as the studies for composite pictures. So then the next question is, how does the artist transform his empirical studies into a finished picture? He or she uh, shapes them according to the set conventions established by artists like Claude Lorraine in the 17th century. And here you can see one example of a river landscape. So uh, the artists then are consistently negotiating between the real, the, what they saw out in the landscape and the ideal, what people expect a, a picture to look like when they actually hang it on the wall. So we know that these artists were immersed in Claude's ideas. And you can see that I've just listed a few of the char characteristics of this landscape, um, the convention on the right. So first of all, you have the framing devices right and left. There's usually a central mountain in the distance. You have the water, the body of water in front of the mountain that oftentimes reflects the mountain and some land in the foreground where figures or animals might stand. So many of the American artists were quite smitten, we know, with um, the ideas of Claude. And for example, when Thomas Cole went to Rome, he made a point of seeking out the studio that was supposed to be the one that Claude Lorraine actually lived in. 
Um, we also know that Asher B. Durand, the so-called Dean of the Hudson River School, uh, his son tells us that, quote, my father had clawed on the brain. So these ideas are very much in the air and the American artists are very much aware of it. So this is what when James and I thought about when, um, you know, Catherine and others told us the theme was entanglement, that idea that Claude's compositions were based on European, oh, sorry, I should have, were based on European landscape, right? He's, he's a French artist living in Rome and he's going out into the Roman Campania. So how does this kind of composition uh, imprint itself on the American landscape? So we began to think of this whole idea of disentangling the American landscape from these European conventions. So what I thought I would do is just take one case study, the subject of Lake George, and just look at a few different images as a way of exploring these disentanglements, uh, analyzing a few pictures. So this is a work by Jacques Milbert. Uh, James will talk more about him in a few minutes, but you can see that, um, again, he's a French artist, comes to the United States actually, travels down the Hudson River, uh, views the area in the Adirondacks and does a series of prints that become uh, quite influential. And here I'm just showing you one example of that type of uh, influence. Thomas Chambers, who's a kind of folk artist, he never went to the Lake George at all. He just took Milbert's print and does his own variation on it. So this just gives you a little bit of an idea of the circulation of these prints and the way they had a certain authority for how to shape landscape art. But um, many of the artists then begin to travel up the, uh, to the Adirondacks. They're fascinated by the idea of the wilderness and uh, the, the possibility of new types of subject matter. And this is just one example. This would be a two page spread from a small sketchbook that th in this case, Daniel Huntington has created. So you can imagine uh, from late spring through the summer into the fall, the artists are traveling in these beautiful places, enjoying these landscapes and doing these empirical studies. Then what they would do is most of them were from the New York area, New York City had studios there. So they return there in the winter months and they do their uh, large scale landscape paintings from these individual studies and, and then exhibit them in New York and hopefully sell them to uh, patrons and collectors. So here is Lake George by John Kensett. Kensett was certainly one of the most uh, popular of the landscape painters of this period. And this Lake George was an especially uh, coveted composition. And though, although today we tend to think, you know, we want an original picture. We don't want someone that has another variation of it. In the 19th century, they didn't think that way so much. So say Mr. Smith goes over to see um, his friend, Mr. Jones, and they have a, he, Mr. Jones has a Kensett. Smith, Mr. Smith decides he wants one too, just like it. So he writes to Kensett and says, please, um, would you paint me one just like the one I saw at, at, the, at Mr. Jones's house? And by the way, could you add a birch tree because I really love birch trees. So there was this kind of give and take. Kensett would try to accommodate people when he could, but you can see that he has, again, still keeping to largely to this Claudian composition. You have the foreground uh, land here, you have the uh, mountains, but um, there's a little bit of more of experimentation trying to show the vastness of the lake and the calmness of the water. And of course, as we look at it, uh, this is 1869, we know that there was a lot of tourism by this time at Lake George, but yet no real sign of, of human presence here. So this is the uh, picture that I wanted to talk about in a little bit more detail because I really find it one of the more provocative uh, images of Lake George. It's by Martin Heed, who um, was tuned into the natural world, but paints it with a sense of, I think, more mystery or even foreboding. Um, being in the Adirondacks, Heed is sensitive to the different character of the terrain and the atmosphere. I think he also, you sense this, almost an urgency about this picture. Um, and he has the freedom to break a little, away a little bit more from some of those Claudian conventions and to try to uh, disrupt our typical understanding. So as he expert Theodore Stebbins declared, there are literally no other pictures like this in American art. Uh, it's been called many different things, surreal, gothic, uncanny. It's just not what we would expect, right? It's more modern and personally expressive. 
So I just want to show you a couple of details to zero in so that you can see a little, appreciate a little bit more kind of what's going on with heat. Um, you can see here that this figure of the man pushing the boat into the water uh, seems to be a bit larger and uh, out of scale with the boat further in the distance. Uh, he, it even seems to be calling our attention more than the mountains or the landscape. So what is going on here? Uh, if you think of that year 1862, when the painting was done, what kinds of things were going on there? What, what could account for this? Any ideas? We know that it was the year into the Civil War and perhaps he's conveying the psychological impact of the war or anxiety. Uh, he, he's also depicting the rocks. Uh, so when you look at them at first, they seem <laughs> superficially truthful. Uh, the details seem real and yet it's kind of spooky. So he, he's Adirondack uh, kind of experience seems to suggest this idea that he's a bit unsettled by it, that it haunts him. And he's trying to somehow convey that there's something interesting or different going on here. But he was also an, an ardent sportsman. And he like, I wanted to bring up another issue which is environmental awareness that in a way artists were the first ecologists. So he is very concerned with what he sees going on in, in, uh, out in the different places where he's traveling and painting. He sees um, people shooting birds just for the feathers to put on women's hats. He sees animals being killed just for a little bit of fur. And the thing that particularly annoys him is that large stretches of nature, of landscape are being set aside as game preserves for, as he puts it, a few millionaires when he thinks that the Adirondacks should be used for widespread public enjoyment. So he, um, for 30 years, he wrote a series of articles for Forest and Stream. He kind of treats it as his bully pulpit. Uh, yesterday, later, this becomes Field and Stream, of course. Um, and so he's writing these letters, uh, talking about, and, and articles talking about these issues and trying to make people more aware. So this is another whole dimension of these artists that the concern for the landscape. Um, and as we all know, uh, there were many, uh, there was a good deal of logging going on for in the Catskills. Uh, also the tanneries were uh, using up the hemlock and the tan bark. So this is just, again, I'm just showing a, a few images to, uh, as a kind of reference point for these different issues that are, um, you know, plaguing the artists at the time. So on the left, you can see, you know, trees being cut down, forests literally being leveled. And on the right, this I think is a really interesting image by another uh, artist named Sanford Gifford. And you can see here, this is the old tannery. It's in ruins uh, down in the corner here. Uh, the, the place where they, of course, um, you know, prepared the skins for uh, use of, for leather. So Gifford is very aware of the kind of destruction that's going on first in the Catskills. He's actually a resident of uh, Hudson, New York. So he's um, very familiar with all of this. But then, as we know, as the uh, resources were depleted in the Catskills, he then, uh, all this activity then moves on to the Adirondacks. So the Adirondacks are also threatened. Uh, this is a painting by Henry Arry, who was uh, Gifford's teacher and friend. And this is a bit of an unusual painting because normally the artists sort of tend to avoid some of the industrial development going along the Hudson. But here you can see on the right where I have this arrow, uh, there's actually this uh, factory or it was actually the Hudson Iron Works. And Gifford's father was actually the co-founder of this uh, particular uh, company that was, as everybody knew, uh, causing great damage to the area and a lot of pollution in the river. So you have this artist Gifford being very well aware of the general um, depletion of the, re of the natural resources, damage to the environment, and knowing also that his father's own company is one of the big instigators for this. So at times he responds to this and he tries to call attention to it as we saw with the tannery. But in other cases, like the, uh, this wonderful uh, painting of Whiteface Mountain, uh, he does suggest this idea of the harmony between man and nature. So there's this constant kind of tension back and forth between uh, the real and the ideal, what, what the artists are seeing out in the landscape, because of course, every year they're going out to these places, they're seeing the changes and they're you know, sketching them, they're studying them more closely than most people. So they know the changes that are occurring. 
But at the same time, if they want to sell a painting, you know, most people don't want to see all the trees chopped down and, um, you know, the pollution in the river. So um, this is a dilemma that the artists face in terms of um, trying to create works that will sell and but will also express their concerns. Well, another aspect that I wanted to mention here was uh, the idea that women are more and more uh, going out into the landscape as well. And this is an, uh, the artist, uh, Eliza Graderex, about whom I just wrote a book called Restless Enterprise. And this is an image, a landscape, not, I'm sorry, of the Adirondacks, but she was in the Adirondacks. She was at Lake George and she was elsewhere. We know there are records of these paintings. We just haven't uh, found them yet. So I think you know, as we go moving forward, we do need to try to think about the presence of the women in the landscape and their contribution to, to all of this. This is another artist, Fidelia Bridges. Again, she too, on the right, you can see this is a photograph she had taken of herself. And this is another thing we don't really think about, but you know, how did women be, cope with these situations of, of, of being out in, out in nature, maybe having to camp out overnight? How did they dress? Um, I'm just showing on the left here, um, a sort of the female dress code for 1870, long hoop skirts, tight bodices, um, fashionable bonnets, and these tiny little parasols. You know, how are you going to climb up a mountain uh, dressed like that? So the women start to devise these uh, various outfits. You can see uh, Fidelia here on the right. Um, this is sort of like the reform dress, the idea that they're wearing pants underneath uh, these shorter dresses. You can see also a much more sensible hat. And she has also her umbrella and her sketching box uh, her, with her. So we again, we'd, we haven't found yet many of the paintings that Fidelia Bridges did in the Adirondacks, but this is just one example of her friend and teacher, uh, William Trust Richards, one of his works. He uh, visited the Adirondacks almost annually for a good, at least 20 years or more. And sometimes she traveled with him. So you can see that in the foreground of this picture, the, the flowers, the very wonderful, uh, closely observed detail of the, of the vegetation. So this is the kind of thing that Fidelia was also doing. So I have to just make a plea that there might be some paintings out there somewhere. Sometimes I hear people tell me, oh, we had this painting on our wall <laughs> since granny was around and we never really thought about it. And it turned out to be, you know, one of the artists that um, was very important. So, you know, th these are things that turn up and we hope that uh, more will turn up. But this is something I found in the Brooklyn newspaper from 1935. They're reporting back on Fidelia Bridges and her friend. Uh, it says she climbed um, Whiteface and, and before that went through Indian Pass, going further than any other woman had gone at the time in 1864. So she still remembered, you know, all this many decades later for doing this. And you can see in the lower right, uh, the wonderful little caricature of her sort of marching along with her uh, <laughs> sensible hat and, uh, you know, her friend worrying about how they're possibly going to get up this mountain. But, uh, but they did manage. And this is just one more woman I'll mention, uh, Susie Barstow. She, again, was a kind of remarkable woman. And, and in some cases, like the work on the left, uh, this work is called Landscape. It's not very specific. It, it could be the Adirondacks. Uh, some more research needs to be done about exactly where, where these people went and when. Uh, the research on the women isn't as, as uh, robust as the male artists, but uh, we're starting to catch up with, about that. But here on the right, you can see um, a few different sketches she's made of different mountain peaks. And she was very well known for, you know, a real, she was a real mountaineer. I mean, she has some sort of record for climbing a hundred peaks and, <laughs> um, and really being a very, um, you know, sportsman, a sporty uh, type of character. But the thing that she did that was interesting, she went a step further than uh, Fidelia's outfit. She actually put hooks all around her waistcoat and on the bottom of her skirt. So if she were to, cl to climb a mountain, she'd be wearing a skirt. She's, you know, proper Victorian women were supposed to do that. But then she would hook up her skirt onto these uh, little attachments, uh, do her climbing. And when she was completed, when, her, when she had gotten to the top, you know, she unhooked the skirt and there she was just as respectable as ever. So these are the, some of the challenges that the woman, women faced, but they met them and they, uh, you know, they still got out there and, and did their thing. And I would suggest that, <clears throat> again, in this case, the, the Adirondacks maybe provided them with um, a special space, a, a, a 
space where they could feel more comfortable. There weren't as many people there. Um, they could uh, be a little <laughs> bit more exploratory. Um, this was a wonderful moment in their lives and they really uh, sort of reveled in it. So finally, I wanted to just conclude with a couple of um, artists of color because again, um, some of you who don't, um, who sometimes don't um, think about some of these issues in terms of who, you know, who's in and who's out of the canon and who do we look at, um, the, the women and the, and the artists of color are really beginning to uh, make much more inroads into the, into the kinds of um, thinking that people have about a landscape. So, you know, 10 years ago, we wouldn't necessarily have mentioned Edward Bannister, but he's a wonderful landscape painter. His subjects are often, again, um, not really identified, but it could have been inspired by the Adirondacks. But what's fascinating about someone like Bannister is that he exhibited at the uh, Centennial in 1876 in Philadelphia. There was a huge exhibition, um, you know, big sprawling fair, but there was a, a big art gallery within that and they gave prizes for some of the best paintings. And so the, at one point they announced, okay, here are the winners for second and third prize and Bannister was one of them. So he was totally shocked, he, he later recorded, and he headed up to the uh, podium to, to get his prize. And when he stepped up to the, to the uh, podium, they said, well, what are you doing here? And they were sh totally shocked that he was a person of color and they tried to withdraw his prize. But um, luckily his fellow artists would not put up with this. They insisted that he had earned the prize and he'd be given it. So these are the kinds of things kinds of barriers that these people had to endure and but yet still managed to uh, persevere and, and paint some wonderful pictures, many of which have been acquired by the Smithsonian American Art Museum. So just to conclude then with this picture, the Robert Duncanson, another Af artist of African-American descent, this is the landscape with rainbows or the rainbow, just one, or uh, which is the so-called inauguration landscape, uh, the one that was shown uh, that actually the new first lady, Dr. Jill Biden, uh, selected as the work to be displayed in the Capitol on the day of the inauguration. So I mentioned this here at the end because uh, we also need to think about the idea that some of these landscapes are actually composites that the artist might have taken a mountain from the White Mountains and uh, a lake from the Adirondacks and trees from the Catskills and compose them because some of these pictures are actually meant to suggest America as Arcadia. But uh, so as we go forward, I think we need to think about the whole idea of the Adirondacks as being very much part of this dialogue and the women and the people of color also being uh, important contributors to these developments. So I'll turn it over to James. Thank you. Thanks, Catherine. <clears throat> We're doing a little bit of musical chairs here. <laughs> so this is a, actually, we don't usually do this, but it's fun. Well, thank you for being here. Um, I've got a few thoughts to share and uh, I'll begin with a quote by uh, Thomas Pownall. Quote, the country lying to the west of these great lakes, Lake Champlain and Lake George, bounded on the north by Canada and on the south by the Mohawk River, called by the Indians, Kusak Reggae, Reggae, uh, which signifies the dismal wilderness of habitation in winter. It's a triangular high mountainous tract. I own, I could never learn anything about it. So you can see here, there's the, uh, this big empty space, which we now call the Adirondacks, Kushsak Rage. And <clears throat> so during his lifetime, during his tenure as Royal a governor of Massachusetts, South Carolina, and as Lieutenant a Governor of New Jersey, Thomas Pownall collected data from his own travels and those of others. These were published in London uh, in 1776, after hostilities had erupted between the mother country and her Atlantic colonies in North America. 
the quote unquote high mountainous track about which Pownall uh, had, had learnt nothing uh, known to us today as the Adirondacks appears to have been in colonial times regarded as the embodiment of a biblical, biblical wilderness into which stray only outcasts and prophets to wrestle with God and scorn the devil. Traveling up and down the Champlain Valley since 1609, European explorers and armies had long beheld the mountainous wilderness along the western horizon. So some had even assayed the navigability of some of its rivers, like the Bouquet, Osable, and Saranac. The first artistic depiction of the Adirondacks was a view of Crown Point delineated by a young artillery officer. Having received his drawing instruction as part of his military training, Thomas Davies exemplified the belief that artistic instruction made keener observers of military officers. This was later reflected by the drawing curriculum at West Point that specified two hours of drawing per day to second and third year cadets, not widely known. The same ethos is echoed by AIDS researcher and MacArthur Prize recipient, Dr. Robert Root Bernstein, who reminds us that scientists who make art make better science than those who do not. In the piece following the conquest of Canada, along with other French colonies in the Caribbean, uh, Pownall and other uh, military officers uh, traveled through uh, North America, uh, producing drawings, sketches on the site. Uh, working from observation, they produced uh, scenic vistas, which were elaborated for the engraver by professional landscape artists like Paul Sandby. Here you see a, a, an engraving of the Palisades uh, by Pownall, elaborated by Sandby. These were like, published to, uh, to con considerable acclaim in 1768 uh, in the Scenographica Americana and the publication of Claude Lorraine's Liber Veritatis, the Book of Truth, six years later. These two, these two uh, publications uh, inspired a revolution in landscape painting. By the time Pownall's topographical description of North America came off the press in 1776, uh, Britannia had taken up arms against um, her siblings across the pond. Here we see another watercolor by Thomas Davies uh, of the attack on Fort Washington, the northern end of Manhattan. <clears throat> Following the American War of Independence, Finding himself again in Canada, in Canada, Thomas Davies painted numerous sites up and down the St. Lawrence River. He was the first European to, do, to depict Niagara Falls from observation. As the old century drew to close, much of the Adirondack region had yet to be explored. Known as the father of watercolor, of watercolor landscape painting, Paul Sandby uh, developed a visual language for the depiction of terrain that bridged the gap between pictorial art and cartography. While Sandby taught drawing to the cadets at the Royal Military Academy at Woolwich, many lesser known topographical artists found employment making portraits of aristocratic estates or scenic views for popular, popular audiences supplied to a burgeoning, uh, su supplied by a burgeoning, like a print industry. Uh, English enamel painter, enamel portrait painter, William Birch and his son Thomas established themselves in Philadelphia by, uh, by issuing with 
with a great success views of the city in 1800. See one, one, one such here. <clears throat> uh, pardon me, other uh, Englishmen trained in the topographical uh, in the topographical tr tradition, like uh, here we see uh, Joshua Shaw <clears throat> joined the fray. Following the failed uh, American invasion of Canada in 1812 and the 1815 Treaty of Ghent, the city of New York was on its way to becoming the financial capital of the new republic. French naturalist Jacques Gerard Milbert arrived in Manhattan in uh, 1816. <clears throat> uh, venturing into the fringes of the Adirondacks, here the Upper Hudson, Milbert recorded his travel in great detail, uh, producing scores of drawings of scenic views from Lake Champlain to the Natural Bridge of Virginia. In 1820, <clears throat> Irishman William Guy Wall and English travel writer John Agg explored together the length of the Hudson from, uh, the, from, from uh, Hadley Luzerne area to uh, New York Harbor. Okay, let's see. The ubiquity of unharnessed waterfalls, go back to this image, in the Hudson River portfolio, 1821 to 25, raises the question if the prints were not intended in part to promote industrial development in the region. Wall's watercolor of the mouth of the Sacandaga River, we'll see later, shows clear-cut hillocks lining the river, presaging an environmental crisis that would, unfold, that, that would unfold in the region half a century later. At this point, Kuksak Rage or Ratirontak was still, for the most part, an unspoiled and undepicted wilderness. In 1823, Milbert returned to France the same year a struggling young English artist relocated to Manhattan from Philadelphia. Three years later, Thomas Cole, uh, two years later, Thomas Cole makes his first sojourn up the Hudson River and paints his picture of Fort Putnam, which is, uh, uh, as we know, at West Point. Following his meteoric debut, Cole returns to his native England and travels to Italy to refine his artistic practice. A view of Tivoli here at Rome. There he finds great cities, ancient ruins, pastoral splendor, and the din of machinery, recalling a few verses from William Blake, and did the countenance divine shine forth upon our clouded hills, and was Jerusalem builded here amid these dark satanic mills. Returning to America, he finds everywhere at abhorrent at hor uh, insults to nature, forests cleared by the ax, waterways soiled by industrial effluence, editing the mills and tanneries out of his pictures, he alludes to their presence by columns of smoke rising in the distance. We see here this one plume of smoke and, and the wonderful exhibition uh, a couple of years ago at the Thomas Cole House and Hudson River Museum uh, uh, called Thomas Cole's Refrain, organized by Dan Peck, uh, spoke specifically about this. Uh, and, and about Cole's you know, environmentalism, his nascent environmentalism. So yearning to return to nature in its savage state, defiant of human intervention, Cole travels to Scroon Lake. In 1835, while exploring beyond the southern portions of Essex County. This painting is actually called Hoffman, or this peak is actually called Hoffman Mountain. Invigorated by the experience, he produces a number of new canvases, including his canonical oxbow, inspired by sketches of the Pioneer Valley in Massachusetts and his memories of the Adirondacks. I don't think 
a whole lot of places on the left look uh, uh, you're, you're you're going to find even then places uh that look quite like this hillside on the left the artist gazes back at the viewer from an untamed mountainside while the valley below has surrendered to cultivation cole's distress is given voice in his 18 41 poem, The Lament of the Forest. There is anger in his words. Quote, our reverent ranks and crashing branches lashed the ground, the mighty trunks, the pride of years, rolled on the groaning earth with all their umbrage, stronger than wintry blasts and gathering strength, swept that tornado stayless till the earth our ancient mother blasted lay and bare." Unquote. While Cole made his final trip to the Adirondacks in 1846, uh, I, I think the experience he had back in the 1830s was very formative. Uh, <clears throat> At the time he was uh, making his final excursion uh, to Long Lake and, and, and other locations, Henry David Thoreau contemplated the relationship between man and nature in a, in a tiny house in a second growth forest in suburban Boston. Thousands of miles away, Theodore Rousseau and a group of landscape painters had found a retreat from pre-Houseman Paris in the sylvan hamlet of Barbizon. Often characterized as perilous and chaotic, wilderness was also regarded as a place for new beginnings, personal renewal through a, a return to nature. In response to rapacious industrialism, the allure of desolation intensified, lost in the wilds in search of oneself. Neither Walden nor Fontainebleau were entirely wild spaces, but managed woodlands, simulacra, environments where one could imagine being in a bona fide wilderness. The Adirondacks, on the other hand, were the real thing. Having grown up in Schenectady, painter and writer William James Stillman had in his youth trekked and paddled through the region. In 1855, a group of Boston intellectuals decided to meet once a month at the Parker House Hotel. And while not a member of this August circle, Stillman's friendship with James Russell Lowell made him welcome at these gatherings. So inspired perhaps by the example of Thoreau or the Barbizon artists, in 1858, Stillman persuaded Lowell, Ralph Waldo Emer Emerson, like Louis Agassiz and other Saturday club luminaries to spend a can's jour in a rustic lace, lakeside camp on a tributary of the Racket River. The Adirondacks promised a more authentic wilderness experience than the more accessible White Mountains of New Hampshire, which was fast becoming overrun with tourists, sportsmen, and Sunday painters. The success of the Philosopher's Camp led to the formation of the Adirondack Club, which, per which purchased land on Ampersand Pond. Accompanied by his new bride and a male companion, writer and illustrator, Benson, <clears throat> Benson Lossing in 1859 reached the summit of Mount Marcy and then followed the Hudson from Lake Tier the Clouds back to the Narrows and Sandy Hook. About the same time, John Brown left North Elba to make his way to Harper's Ferry. Later that year, he would return for the last time. The Civil War derailed Stillman's dreams of establishing a durable retreat at Ampersand Pond. Publication of Lossing's book was postponed to 1866. During the conflict, the Civil War, attention shifted from the wild north country to the far west. Photographs by Oneonta native Carlton Watkins helped to convince Lincoln to set aside the Yosemite Valley 
and the Mariposa Big Tree Grove for public use on June 30th, 1864. A few years later, activism by Rousseau and the artist colony at Barbizon convinced Napoleon III to preserve 2,500 acres of the Foyer de Fontainebleau as the world's very first national park. Professional artists like Albert Bierstadt and Thomas Moran accompanied railroad and mineral surveys to the far west. Gonna buy that teleprompter. Moran's Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone, we see here, helped to convince the US Congress in 1872 to pass legislation creating the first national park in the United States. There was a dark side to this story, however. Just prior to the Civil War, a Cheyenne chief named Niwot encountered a mining party, party entering the Boulder Valley, Colorado. In his failure to dissuade them to leave, he declared that, quote, people seeing the beauty of this valley will want to stay and their staying will be the undoing of its beauty." Unquote. Five months to the day after Lincoln signed Senate Bill 203, the Yosemite Valley Grant Act, Chief Niwot and more than 150 other members of the Cheyenne Nation were brutally massacred by Colorado militia at Sand Creek. By now, the audience knows where I'm going with this. Established in 1869, Transcontinental Railway service opened remote sections of the far west to mining, settlement, and tourism. Not to be outdone, a burst of activity commenced in the North Country. Land was acquired by private interests. Great camps and hotels proliferated. Tourists flocked to the region. Winslow, Winslow Homer, you see here, and Arthur Fitzwilliam Tate both popularized and mythologized the Adirondacks as the quintessential original American wilderness. Pownall's Kushsukrage was still uh, a place of mystery, obscure, forbidding, and inspiring. Books, articles, and stereographs by Seneca Ray Stoddard both celebrated the beauty of the region while promoting it as a destination for vacationers and sportsmen. This in the long run posed the threat to that beauty, Chief Niwot's curse. When William Stillman returned to Fallensby and Ampersand, he was horrified by the sight of high peaks stripped of vegetation, of forests submerged by dammed waterways, of land scorched by spreading campfires. The fact that he was not alone ultimately led to the establishment of the Adirondack Park as a place to be kept forever wild. So how did the American, how, how did the, how was the American landscape shaped by the Adirondacks? Well, let's go back a little bit. So uh, the margins of an ungovernable wilderness described by Paolo were first depicted by military topographical and, and artists and then later by naturalists like Milbear and by traveler artists like William Guy Wall. Here we see Milbear on the right and William Guy Wall on the left. These are basically views of the very same place. You can see there's a bridge crossing this stream, which is the mouth of the Sacandaga. Here we're, we're having a look from that stream over towards Wall's point of view. And, and ironically, they were both traveling about the same time. Here you can also see uh, these hills are completely clear cut. If 
you go there today, there's a huge forest. This work, these prints that come out of the print industry, that comes out of topographical art, that comes out of military art, uh, this is what laid the groundwork for Tom, Thomas Cole, in my humble opinion, who ventured further, who ultimately ventured deep into the interior of the Adirondack region. Inspiring younger artists, Cole's nascent environmentalism reflects the zeitgeist expressed by, by French and English artists at that time. One might say that Stillman's uh, philosopher's uh, camp also became a paradigm for artist colonies and retreats across the nation uh, starting the end of the 19th century. Places like um, well, Taos Colony, Group of Seven, the idea of wilderness as a think tank and, inc and, and incubators in, is embraced by these artists and numerous others. One that comes to mind is, uh, you know, uh, George O'Keefe. Uh, you know, just as Watkins, Rousseau, and Moran helped convince governments to set aside land for national parks, artworks testifying to the natural beauty of the Adirondack region helped argue the case for uh, its preservation. So promoting environmental awareness is central to the missions of a number of artists whose work I admire. And I just thought I would do a shout out to them here. We've got Anne Diggory, Brandon Ballanger, James Prosak, Wynne Ray, Rachel Finn, uh, and, and others. Ecological studies and environmental humanities at institutions of higher learning are on the rise across the country. Blessed with the diversity of terrain, flora, and fauna, with its close proximity to major cultural centers, the Adirondack wilderness is naturally suited to Stillman's vision of a creative think tank and Sylvan symposium, forever wild. Thank you. Thank you so much and um, from, to both of you for a really interesting presentation. Um, let's see, I'm gonna... Read I'm, gonna I'm gonna do one thing I was asked uh, to mention that some of our publications are available at uh, the new uh, Whitcomb Art Center across the road from the Grange. So I'm gonna put this slide up here. Terrific. And encourage people to go see Teddy Rogers over at uh, Whitcomb's on Route 22. And <coughs> pardon me. And uh, if anybody has any questions beyond uh, the Q and A that we're going to be able to to uh, tackle here, they can always email us at this address. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, okay. We do have a few questions um, and. Um, that was from Mary Nell, who asks whether the idealization of these landscapes, removing the factories or clear cutting, was that controversial at the time? Or was it debated within art circles? Uh, Kathy, you want to answer that? Please go ahead. Perfect. I I think I think no, because I think that um, the idea of verbatim realism was sort of frowned upon. I mean, the whole idea of art was to improve on nature. And so um, artists were naturally offended by, uh, by, by the ravages of industrialism. And, uh, and also they were, they were consciously fictionalizing uh, the data in order to make the expression more artistic. They, they even talked about this idea that uh, we are not mere copyists 
we are, you know, interpreters. So, you know, there was that there was that side uh, side to it that 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 one didn't it wasn't meant to be taken as a rec just a record of a place, but rather an interpretation and, and an idealization of the place. So it was understood at the time um, for the most part. Interesting. And um, we have a second question from Joe, who asks, was Cole aware of the work of Claude Lorraine? Oh, yeah. Was, was Cole aware of Claude Lorraine? Yes. Oh, absolutely. Well, I think um, I, I did mention in, the, um, in my talk, but maybe the details got lost. Uh, he was so aware of it that when Cole goes to Rome, he actually seeks out the studio where Claude Lorraine was supposed to have lived and worked. So he's literally wants to be in the same space that, uh, you know, that this great master had been in. And, um, you know, some of the other landscape painters I mentioned, Asher B. Durand, another of the Hudson River School, his son says he actually had Claude on the brain, you know, <laughs> this idea that it was almost like a mania. <coughs> so, uh, so they were very much aware of it. Um, it, it. The prints were widely distributed by the 19th century, so they knew them partly just through the prints, but there were, you know, and when they went to England, they actually uh, saw the some of the the, paint the paintings by Claude in the different collections. And we know that um, a lot of the artists, you know, had access to some of the, even when there wasn't a museum open, they would have access to some of the private homes. And certain um, American artists who were over there would serve as kind of hosts uh, to bring them to these different homes and to even meet some of the artists like Constable. They wanted to meet Constable. so. Um, you know, so, so they were very aware of these traditions and, um, you know, desperately wanted to be part of it because just think of it, these are provincial, in a way they felt they were provincial, they were missing out on something because here they were over in America without a lot of great art and no museums at the time, Nicole was uh, studying really, and then, um, you know, Europe has this great advantage. So there was this, always this feeling like, um, you know, they had to catch up. Mm. Uh -huh. Um, can I ask you to stop sharing your screen so the um, the oh, audience? Sure. I just wanted everybody to be able to get a screenshot of that. So that yes, can. for sure. All right. Um, yeah. I'm not see I'm not seeing additional questions. Oh wait, one more. Let's see. Um, as a question from Charles, who asks, as scholars, are you interested in the living artists today who continue these landscape traditions? Parentheses. Wonderful presentation! Exclamation point. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes. But I, I would I would say that um, I think it, it I'm more interested in those artists who also are concerned with who who are more concerned with environmentalism and historic preservation and things like that rather than merely uh, polemics of style issues of style like you know people who you know tend to self-identify as a realist painter uh, tend to make that you know subject of their work I think I think the value of landscape painting today or landscape art today is is that it's you know calling attention to the terrain in thoughtful engaging ways and hopefully to quote uh, environmental artist Stacy Levy She's, she just wants people, you know, to pay attention to uh, natural places so they might come to care about them and then they might want to do something about keeping them that way. So, you know, that's sort of my motivation. And yeah, I think there are Absolutely. Of... It, it's uh, stewardship is definitely a thing on all of our minds, those of us who live here and those of us who are far away and come here and are sad to see changes. Um, and I think your interest, you're pointing towards the stewardship value of some of these historical paintings is quite interesting. Um, I, we do have a few more questions um, and it looks like we're just about at eight o'clock. So because um, we do have several more questions, we're gonna um, go over a little bit. And for any of you who have to leave, we're sorry to see you go, but also um, just a reminder to everyone that the programs are recorded and will be posted on the um, Grange's YouTube channel. So you can see the pre any of the previous uh, presentations as well as tonight's presentation uh, after, just give us a little bit of time to get it posted. This is the first time we've actually had this kind of tandem Zoom thing, right? It's very, 
uh, it's it's it you know it, it was a learning curve tonight, so it was fun. But uh, well, thank you for doing it. So we, we as I say, we do have a few more questions. Sarah Linda asks, can you comment on the irony of the Barbizon and later the Impressionist schools of art whose concerns were similar, eventually eclipsing the reputation of the Hudson River School? Um, you want to take that? Well, I think um, you know there are there are various reasons for that. Uh, when the when the history of art of modernism was was you know written in the twentieth century after World War II, uh, there was a sort of tendency to look back on these earlier artists and to try to find um, you know ancestors for what was going on. And so um, you know people like the Impressionists and the Barbizon, they there tended to be this sense of you know these isms, like one thing leads to the next to the next, and so people uh, in the 20th century were seen as being the direct uh, descendants of these earlier artists. And uh, as that was happening, a lot of the, you know, the American artists were, weren't really uh, taken into the equation in the same way. And I think um, it, it was very, you know, very kind of unfortunate because it took until, it was really right around the bicentennial in 1976, um, and maybe a little bit earlier that uh, people started to really look back and um, you know think about these earlier figures and realize you know just how much they had to offer and you know a history of art started to really start being revised and and to include more of these people and also in France I mean there were you know other artists in France that were in all over Europe and and Latin America now is being folded into it too so it's it's um it's really a very different animal when you think about uh, who's being looked at today as artists versus even, you know, 30 years ago. Well, I think also that we had just fought a war to, to obliterate nationalism. And so celebrating, uh, you know, American art, even regionalism was, was not the thing to do. It was, it was a like formalist narrative that, um, that they really could, they really couldn't plug those artists into that story, and uh, so they were left out. I mean, it was invented. It was an invent. Every, I mean, it's it's not like a bona fide genealogy. It was it was invented by people to create the ancestry they wanted. You know, that's mm -hmm. a bit selective. Yeah. Um, here's another question from Bill. There seems to be some stylistic similarities between George Catlin's work and many of the works you've shown here tonight. Was Catlin exposed to the works of these artists before going out west to become famous in his own right? Oh, sure. He was uh, he was working in Philadelphia. He knew all of those. He knew the print culture. Everybody knew the print culture, uh, and so he he his aesthetic was much more kind of like painting on the run. It was very very fast and sort of get it put it down move on to the next one he wasn't he wasn't a terribly contemplative painter but no he was uh he was absolutely aware of uh, of of everything that thomas cole was aware of he just he just decided to go in a different direction also i mean he comes from uh catlin comes from connecticut right no pennsylvania well, anyway, um, he's from the Northeast. Right. And so, you know, the, he, it, he was, you know, he goes out West, he later he also goes to South America, but he's, you know, he's part of that, um, you know, group and, and um, later he's uh, showing his, his Indian gallery in London. So, you know, he, he's also, you know, sort of traveling the same circuits. It's just mm -hmm. a slightly different um, focus. Yeah, Cat uh, yeah. Nope, go right ahead. No, I mean, Cat, Cat, I think Catlin represents more, more uh, a direct reiteration of the British topographical tradition, you know, represented by people like Thomas Davies. And, uh, and then you have other artists like the, you know, Kern brothers and other expeditionary artists who are working with the army. They are actually embedded in military expeditions. And they're there to produce maps and pictures of what's being explored, and they're not—they're not necessarily exhibiting with the professional artists. An, ex an exception would be somebody like Seth Eastman, who taught drawing at West Point, was an honorary academician, 
uh, you know, a member of the National Academy, but, but he was an unusual case. But Catlin starts out as a portrait painter. And when he's out West, yes, he paints the landscape, but his main um, objective is the Native Americans, the figure, right? He's, he's painting the figures. So in a way he's um, sort of straddling these two different traditions in a way that, you know, Thomas Cole, if he paints the figure, it's usually small and, and um, not the main point of his picture. So, um, you know, the, there, there's a crossover, there's a, there's a shared tradition, but then they do go off in different directions, I would say. But I just want to say too, that I think the whole idea of the Adirondacks is the original, you know, Kush Sak Rage, you know, this is this sort of wild place. Nobody, in, in fact, I didn't include the whole quote, but Pownell says that the Indians claim not to know anything about it and they might be wisely keeping that knowledge from the Europeans, but but that it was it was an acknowledged as a sort of uh, an unknown territory, you know, and it was it was a blank spot on the map until the early 19th century. So it had a mythic potential. Uh -huh. A mythic potential it still does. Yeah, indeed it does. <laughs> A few more questions. Martha um, Smiles asks, have you studied the work of Harold Weston and Rockwell Kent, their continuation of the traditions of Homer and Cole in the Adirondacks? Yeah, sure. We know those guys. And I think, I think, uh, well, uh, uh, Kent was over in Jay, right? He was in the Osable Valley. And so, um, I mean, I think artistically he was it was a very different narrative, you know, that he was not, uh, you know, like, a, you know, doing paintings of, of, uh, of people shooting a, you know, like a deer in a lake, which was popular thing to do uh, up here in the 19th century. But, uh, but it could almost be that the 20th century material could be a whole, you know, it's like a whole different lecture, really. And, you know, at first we were thinking of trying to include people like George O'Keefe and Stieglitz, who are, you know, have a house, had a house on right on Lake George. That's Lake now George. Condominium, condominiums, right? And um, they did some wonderful images that were in a, you know, <laughs> her, her work at Lake George was shown at the Hyde Collection. So, you know, there's, there's so much that we can include. This was just kind of the absolute tip of the iceberg. <laughs> Uh, we found that every week that these conversations just keep leading to more and more ideas and more and more questions and conversations. So that's a good thing. We want to leave our audience wanting more. Um, <laughs> this opens opportunities for the future. Um, we do have a few more questions if you still have time. Um, the Kirsten asks, were the artists also aware of the then new movement of transcendentalism brought about by Emerson and Thoreau? Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, Stillman was, you know, honorary, like a member of the Saturday Club, and he was, he was friendly with uh, Lowell and Emerson and and New Thoreau. I think. I mean, there were it was a small world, you know. So, uh, absolutely. I well, think. Yeah, and people like Heed uh, is sometimes identified as a luminist. Um, uh, using that terminology to sort of suggest the idea of very peaceful uh, pictures, uh, almost a kind of transcendental approach. So they've been, connect you know, people like Keat have also been connected with um, the, the Emerson and Thoreau. But to keep in mind too, that those, uh, the, the transcendentalists, they were also on the lecture circuit. We tend to forget that you didn't necessarily have to be reading, you know, um, deep, you know, poetry or even have these books. These men were, um, you know, going around to Lyceum and Granges and giving lectures all over, the, all over the, um, you right. know, the country. And so um, that was one of the things I did when I was trying to connect one artist I was working on. Um, could this artist have heard any of these lectures? And I sort of tracked their uh, lecture schedule versus where the where the artists were. And so, you know, it was a. It, it was a small world then. They, they sort of, this was popular entertainment when, when you didn't have anything, um, you know, the same kind of entertainment we have, you would go to hear these lectures. And so these men were like rock stars in a way. So mm, they right. were, you know. Uh, it's interesting that they use, use the word, I think you said luminous. Mm -hmm. um, and um, Nell Painter asks, what about the Flemish painters like Jacob van Rysdale? I think that's how you say his name. Uh, he was Dutch, yeah. Um, the, Rosedale, yeah. Roystale. Roystale. The Flemish yeah. painters. The Flemish painters. Dutch. He was northern. Dutch. Northern. Nor northern. Yeah. He was are Dutch. there other? Are there others? 
I don't know. I'm unfamiliar. There, there are many. No, I think the Dutch landscape, uh, the the Dutch landscape tradition is being constructed at the same time that Claude Lorraine is in Rome painting his, uh, you know, picturesque views. And I think that the Dutch, there are a number of, of terrific works on, you know, Dutch painters. I'm thinking about Svetlana Alper's book and, and others where they speak about sort of the, the choreographic pride in, in local settings. You know, so that that somebody from Utrecht is going to want a painting of Utrecht, and they're going to want a painting of this flower farm, and they're going to, you know, and it was all recognizable, but it was also a matter of pride. And you look at Vermeer paintings, and there, you know, there's an opinion that that's why he's painting maps on the wall, you know, sort of to remind people where they are or where he is. So. But, but also, if we're talking about the uh, intersection or the influence of these artists on the Americans, um, Vermeer wasn't so much known in the 19th totally century. Totally unknown. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, but some of these other artists were known and collected by Americans, or right. at least copies of them. So we mm -hmm. know that you know, they were in Boston, they were in Gloucester. Um, so the, the artists would have seen these works you know, with the low horizon line, the very detailed um, you know, townscapes and the beautiful clouds. So they would, you know, so definitely the Americans are taking these different influences and bringing them together to bear on the American landscape they're seeing. And, and you know, it, it's not just one influence, although Claude was, um, you know, pretty, pretty uh, standard, but um, th there are lots of things going on in these pictures. So I think whatever people are noticing in these pictures, it's probably all true. <laughs> Yeah, but I think the one thing that people forget is the is is the profound in, impact of the print industry on the popular understanding of landscape, indeed on artists, because the way artists were taught was to to copy prints. You know, they didn't. There were no museums in you know, the 17th or 18th century. If you had no access to a duke or a king or a lord. You couldn't see these pictures. The only way you could see them would be through prints. And the irony of the whole Claude being sort of the father of this is that Claude's Liber Veritatis, which was a catalog of his compositions, was not published until six years after Cenographia Americana. So North American landscapes were seen by popular audiences before Claude which I find interesting, you know? And I, I see there's a potential here to expand the sort of genesis narrative of American landscape art to include the British military topographical artists and these people who were painting country estates and people like William Birch and so forth and William Guy Wall who were very formative. Interesting, interesting stuff. Uh, let's see, I've got a few more questions here. Um, actually, a question from Laura, who says, uh, she made an interesting comment, I think, earlier in the chat as well, that she had a painting. She has a, she, um, well, the, let, let's get on to the question, and I'll look back into it for her comment. Um, I didn't realize the Adirondacks were more inaccessible than the mountains in Vermont and New Hampshire. How did they get there? To the uh, it, well, in the case of the philosopher, it depends when you're talking about. Mm -hmm. I mean, nobody was going there until uh, the early 1800s, and I think I think bear in mind that people were moving by water. Everything moved by water, and so indeed. there was natural natural portage from the Hudson River at Glens Falls. To Lake George, and then you could go down the the La Chute to Lake Champlain, and then you could go down the Richelieu to, you know, the St. Lawrence. So you could literally go from New York to Montreal with with a fair a couple of short portages. I mean, excluding all the waterfalls on Hudson, but uh, it was it was done, you know. And then the canal mm -hmm. was built early early on too. The canal from uh, from Fort Miller to Whitehall was complete. Eight, I think before eighteen twenty three, right? Eighteen before the Erie Canal, right before. So, uh, I think yeah. If if you if you're talking about like the philosophers' camp, 
Emerson, those guys, they, they, um, they took a boat up to Burlington and then crossed over to um, Port Kent. And then they took a stagecoach up to Saranac Lake. And then from there, they took guide boats uh, up to, to the Racket River and then, and then into Follinsby Pond. So that's how they got there. And Ginny Waters asks, how do you situate your own work relative to the Hudson River School and other 19th century artists? Well, I, I don't, I, I'm not trying to paint like them, I'm trying to be like them. As one of my teachers from Yale, William Bailey, who just passed away, said one of the, one of the great quotes of Joseph Albers for artists who were, you know, the kids in, in the program were trying to paint like him, he would say, don't paint like me, be like me. And I think when I think about the Hudson River School, I think about artists who are interested in, who are engaged with environmentalism, historical content, literature, Ken set. Okay, now correct me if I'm wrong. Here we have a gay former engraver turned landscape painter who managed to get himself on the committee that is deciding design decisions on the renovations of the US Capitol in the 1850s. Name one artist who's doing that today. I'll volunteer, but I think the building doesn't need any more work. But, uh, <laughs> but no, I mean, I think I, 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 I try to be inspired by their example and not try to imitate uh, their, their manner of painting. Fair enough. Uh, and another comment um, from, by Michael says, with the current dominance of digital technology, can you speak to the importance of drawing and painting in the current climate? Oh dear, we should, we no, need an hour for that, this. No, no, that's easy. <laughs> nope, that's another easy. presentation, okay. No, 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 that, well, that's another presentation, <laughs> but the short version is that drawing is just another form of writing. If you don't know how to write, you can't read. If you can't read, you can't write. If you can't draw, you can't see, you don't understand design. There's no way to read what you're looking at. You're only, you know, using it through trial and error or responding to taste or whatever. But in the 19th century, everybody who had a high school education could draw as well as they could write. And that is a fact. And now it's no longer true. So we've become a visually illiterate society, awash in images. And so I think that the digital revolution has actually led to uh, increased interest in drawing because if you take a look at uh, organizations like Pixar, what do they do? They draw. There was a show at MoMA, uh, it, was, it was a Pixar show. They were showing all of their films, but the exhibition it was all drawings and multicolored drawings where each designer has a pencil and they're all drawing on the, a different color and they're all drawing on the same drawing to have this conversation, this visual conversation. So I wrote about that, but I think that, um, I think that the digital age has been great for drawing. I think uh, I remember interviewing the former Dean of the Maryland Institute College of Art, Bray Allen, and he commented, he said, he said, we have, we have a lot of kids who go into the digital animation field. He said, if all, all you know is the technology, all you can be is a technician. Unless you know how to draw, you can't be a designer. Unless you can draw a human figure doing anything naked on a lunch napkin at a, or at a, on a paper napkin at a lunch meeting, you can't be a designer in the digital field. You can't be an animator. You have to know how to draw. What about Dan Leapskin? Oh yeah, well, Daniel Liebskin, when we were at the opening of the Denver Art Museum Hamilton Wing, he gave this great talk about taking a line for a walk. And I asked him afterwards, we're all having drinks and mixing and mingling. And I asked him, I said, well, do you, you know, what, what's the role that you know, the digital media has in your, uh, in, in, in your, in your like, a design process? He says, Oh, they're just technicians. He says, we all, we all draw with ink, pencil, pen, whatever. You know, it's like the, the thinking is done with, with eye hand, you know, analog tools. Maybe some, 
some people could use an iPad and a stylus. And that's just, that's just a mark and a surface. It's still drawing. Innovations will happen and um, trad traditions will grow. <laughs> uh, okay, it looks like we have two more questions or one comment, one question. Sarah Linda commented, and furthermore, the romantic tradition in Europe, Turner, the sublime and Constable, the picturesque in England. So we have lots more to talk about, no doubt. Um, and But for tonight, I think that we probably should wrap up. And I want to um, remind people that some of your books are available over at Whitcomb's. The other question was really about the little place across the street from the Grange, which is Whitcomb's Garage. It is a great project of the Grange. And I encourage you all to stop by and visit in person where you can find um, some interesting artists and interesting um, items for sale. Uh, we do have two more um, presentations in this series on entanglements. Next week we'll be uh, pulling apart or um, we're disentangling the relationship between history and historical fiction with hmm. two members of the Grange board, Andrea Barrett, who is um, a writer and Andy Buchanan, who is a historian. That one will be interesting. Right. And the last um, one in our series will be um, Racy Henderson will be talking about the um, entangled world between food abundance and food scarcity in the North Country. And I think that um, both of those will be will be very interesting. Just a reminder that tonight's presentation will be um, uh, it has been recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel. Just check into the Grange's website. Yeah. And um, if you have additional questions, again, you can reach us through the through the Grange and we'll forward them on. Um, and once again, thank you so much to our presenters tonight. Um, and it looks like we have a lot of uh, comments and thank yous for you tonight, which we'll be glad to share um, with you after tonight's presentation. Thank so, you, Elizabeth, thanks, for all your help. Thanks for your, your attention and your help. And it's been it's been a real pleasure. <laughs>